Well, it, <laughs> uh, it, brings, it brings back a lot of stuff. Uh, I think what's interesting is that it, it's impossible for people who weren't involved at that time and who weren't involved in what was going on in the world at that time to really understand the dynamics that were at play. Vietnam really did make it crazy. Uh, but the other thing, and I think the thing the movie doesn't really deal with that much, is the fact that there was a revolution going on. There was a revolutionary struggle going on all over the world. Uh, and there was, and in most places it was violent. And in most places, and the United States played an incredibly uh, reactionary role all over the world, uh, supporting all of the repressive uh, uh, reactionary regimes, and there was there were hundreds of thousands of people who were involved in this country in opposing that war, and who had uh, an evolving vision of building something better and different. Uh, the people who the weather people were a very 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 small percentage of that group, uh, but in a lot of ways what they did was they took what was happening to its logical extreme uh, because people felt that they had to do something and it was in fact uh, a worldwide phenomenon and their whole thing about bringing, that, bringing it home even though I think that a lot of us in retrospect and at that time we thought it was misdirected and, and wrong-headed uh, and there are people who believe that they were responsible for it destroying what was happening with the movie, which I think was true, because they were more a reflection of what was happening. Uh, but, I don't know, that's a first impression. Jim? Um, when uh, Brian Flanagan and, and Thor also uh, talked about Vietnam making us crazy, um, I think that is true, but another thing made us crazy too, and that was the recognition that the United States was the biggest terrorist entity in the world, it was reigning hundreds of thousands of tons of munitions on the top of the heads of uh, people in, in Vietnam and was supporting by the School of the Americas uh, repression, violent repression, uh, murderous repression in South America, in Africa, um, in any place where the downtrodden were picking themselves up off of the ground and saying, we want a better life. So it was this kind of uh, recognition of the violence. But the other thing that made us crazy was that that violence was direct, came to be directed against us. As soon as we started becoming effective, as soon as the anti-war movement that started in the early 60s started getting traction and starting uh, uh, making its point and, and expanding and growing into the, the large marches in Washington and so forth. The United States government, through COINTELPRO, we found out later, uh, targeted all of us and um, waded into demonstrations with clubs, peaceful demonstrations, completely pacifistic demonstrations. So it was totally peaceful beginning, but the response was, was abject violence. That made us a little crazy. And at some point, I started feeling like that I didn't want to just sit down on the ground and, and be the, uh, and the practice, the, the, uh, the dummy for some policeman's billy club. I wanted, if I was going to get beaten up by the cop, I was going to fight back. So this kind of thing, I think, led the, um, um, the kind of thing that the, uh, the, the weather underground, um, I think this was the kind of thing that, that, that uh, pushed them forward into the kind of uh, uh, stance that they took. The, the question of violence, it, it was
was a very complex and complicated. Uh, the, the movement grew out of our roots were in the civil rights movement, which was uh, which embraced uh, nonviolence as as a tactic, and also I think as a it also came from from the heart. And we were sort of we grew up out of that. Uh, but and I you know I mean I was always even though not you know I didn't. It really embraced the philosophy of nonviolence. I was always basic, basically a pacifist in my approach to things. I've never, I can't ever, I can't imagine being involved in violence. But uh, the fact is that as we saw violence being used against not only people all over the world, but against our brothers and sisters, uh, and as we came to an understanding, a conclusion that people in other parts of the world who were oppressed, even if we didn't believe in using violence, we had to understand that, we had to sort of acknowledge that they had the right, that the oppressed had the right to use violence against the oppressor. Once you came to that conclusion, it, was, it wasn't that hard to take the next step and believe that we legitimately could use violence against our oppressors. I, I, one thing that I think is important for people to realize is that I, I was involved in SDS from pretty much the early days. I came to Austin in 63, and I first got involved in SDS not long after that, and was involved in the organization nationally. Uh, and then I worked in, we, I started, we started underground newspapers here in, in Austin and Houston, and I worked with Liberation News Service in New York. And I was in New York at the time that really the weatherman was starting to kind of emerge, was starting to, to, to coalesce. <coughs> but then I came back to Texas, and we were involved in doing all kinds of things, and there were people all over the country doing all kinds of things, and working in collectives, and uh, doing community organizing, and doing, you know, doing food co-ops, and doing, and women's liberation movements started evolving, and all of this stuff was happening, and what happened with Weatherman at that point was something that was just very, very removed from any of our lives. Um, I was never, Jim was involved in, in I guess in, in some stuff more directly, not in with Weatherman, but more directly with, uh, well, Jim was involved with the Gibbies, uh, and uh, like, you know, uh, was testified for a grand jury, or was called to testify for, for a grand jury, and went in a guerrilla suit. Why don't you tell me to tell me that stuff, because that's kind of fun. <laughs> And a, a bit of a diversion, but also it was also very tied up to the role that, that the FBI and COINTELPRO and the repressive, uh, the, the, how repressive the government had become at that point. Well, yeah, I'll give you a little biography. I, I'm um, in the uh, early '60s. I was in Bloomington, Indiana, and um, I'm a member of SDS and the Bloomington chapter of SDS. Um, and, uh, but I was also a uh, co-founder and editor of an underground newspaper, which um, apparently was very effective because um, I, the uh, FBI uh, tried put a, put a lot of energy into stopping the paper and um, and stopping me as editor uh, to the point where I, um, in 1967, um, I was indicted for uh, three counts of uh, violation of the draft law, which were totally spurious. It was a, 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 a frame-up. Um, I was convicted and sentenced to six years in prison, and um, shortly before the Democratic National Convention in, in Chicago, I was in jail um, uh, waiting to see whether my appeal bond would be uh, allowed. Uh, they would, uh, had tried to um, deny my right to appeal the convictions. Um, I did get out of jail um, and um, moved to New York where um, I became involved in um, the Lower East Side artist and, and political movement. Um, I uh, got involved with the Yippies. I um, uh, met Jerry Rubin and got the job ghostwriting uh, his um, book Do It, which was uh, a um, New York Times bestseller for about a year. Um, 
and um, became very involved in, in movement activities. Um, during this period of time, well, prior to the Weather Underground, there, uh, there was a guy named Sam Melville who um, had, was put together a small uh, collective of um, uh, bomb builders um, that uh, targeted major capitalist headquarters in New York City. Uh, one night they orchestrated five explosions in five different, like Gulf Oil and uh, um, uh, United Fruit, which was a big oppressor in, in, uh, in Latin America, and uh, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, and two other places. Uh, bombs that went off within like minutes apart um, with again taking care that there were no casualties. These were symbolic uh, theatrical actions to to show the outrage of uh, the uh, left against um, the practices of capitalism. Uh, Sam eventually got was caught and um, sent to prison. Uh, but during that period of time, I got to know uh, a number of his friends. And um, through some of those things, I, you know, uh, I, I became very much involved in, in um, a, a militant part of the, uh, the movement in uh, New York. One thing. Well, again, yeah. right after the the event that um, was talked about was at the Capitol, the Capitol bombing, um, a uh, federal prosecutor named Guy Goodwin um, convened a grand jury in New York and called uh, seven of us. bus. Um, I was one of the seven people who was called before that grand jury. Uh, he also convened grand juries in Phoenix, in uh, Seattle, in Los Angeles, uh, Milwaukee, and Chicago. The idea is to bring, you know, it was, it was a witch hunt, basically, to bring people forth and to try to force information out of them. Um, the um, grand jury in uh, New York, um, well, if you remember the film, the, the woman with the curly hair and had the uh, National Liberation um, uh, flags painted on her cheek. Um, that was Judy Gumbo. She was, uh, was a good friend of mine then and now. Um, and a Gimby. Uh, she was the one who was saying, uh, we didn't do it, but we dig it. Um, <laughs> Judy was one of the people called before this grand jury. The guy that was standing beside her, uh, Stu Albert, was another person. And um, so we all came to the grand jury dressed in costumes. Stu came dressed in a rainbow sequin dress. He's got big, big blonde hair, big beard, 6'2", very stocky. And he went and came in a rainbow sequin uh, dress that said Bernadine across the front. Um, Judy and the two women that were uh, uh, called that uh, came dressed as, as witches and called their brooms. And uh, I came in a gorilla costume because they were looking for gorilla fighters. Uh, they, uh, the gr grand jury stopped there. They, they didn't um, feel like that, uh, that they could call any of us to talk to the um, uh, 80 and 90 year old people who can sit on grand juries. <laughs> uh, afraid that our behavior might cause cardiac arrest or something. Uh, so the grand jury stopped, ground to a halt right there uh, outside the door, and the rest of the grand juries in, uh, across the country were also canceled. Uh, it was kind of an interesting little uh, victory for, uh, for, the, for the crazies. <laughs> uh, something in a, a, on a different track. I, I don't know if you, how many, there might be some of you who don't know what Jim and I do now. I was, I was the original editor of The Rag, uh, which was Austin's underground newspaper that started in 1966 and lasted until 1977. And, uh, we
which was one of the first and one of the most influential of the underground newspapers in the country. Well, we've recently kind of revived that whole thing. And we put out a, a thing called the Rag Blog, which has become, we've had over a million visitors and we get about 50,000 visitors a month. And I'm also doing a show on co-op, uh, Rag Radio. And like Bernadine Dorn and Bill Ayers, Judy Gumbo, Albert, Mark Rudd, these people are all friends of ours now. And it's very interesting because they're all, all of them. Uh, Bernadine Dorn has, uh, if you want to go to RAG Radio, and go to the Internet Archive. And look, we've, I've done an hour interview with Bernadine Dorn. I've done two or three. I've done a, two with Bill Ayers and one with Bill and his brother Rick. Uh, they all have written for, for the RAG blog, and as has Judy Gumbo, Albert. Uh, and uh, they're all incredibly smart, sweet people doing important things. So, and, and even though we didn't go in the direction they went, these were some of the best and, and, and brightest people in the movement and really in the, you know, in our generation. So, I'm interested to know what people out there want to know. Yeah, I decided. Uh, why would you call me the I say. Okay. Beard, the eyebrows. Cool is beard. Sort of. I, I have a question about violence. Um, I feel like today, Especially with people my age, I'm, I'm, 20, I'm 26, and people younger than me, violence is such a recreational thing today. And I'm not just talking about um, like how MMA fighting, all that kind of junk is so popular, but it, like even with the way people view it in context, violence is viewed almost like any other physical activity, like yoga or something. It's like something that people accept as necessary sometimes. And so it's so commonplace. And also, our, like, people my age are so, um, I mean, this is said all the time, but we're very desensitized to it. Um, but it, it seems like um, back then, like, uh, during, the, during this movement, during the Vietnam War, especially with the Vietnam War being the first visual war, like the first war that the American people could see so much of, because it was so heavily broadcast at that time, like violence must have been so much more severe um, contextually and culturally at that time. Like it, must have, it must have felt so much stronger than it does today. I mean, violence today is almost meaningless. Well, it, 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 and our, the culture, the society was so different. And, our, and, and like as young people compared to what young people today experience, I mean, it's it, it, it was a, a, a much more innocent time, and that innocence we lost that innocence to a great extent over 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 this time. Uh, but yes, violence was not something that was as much a part of our lives. Violence was more removed. Violence was something that happened more somewhere else. If you were white, uh, you know, and if you were in a and if you were in a reasonably protected or full kind of environment, violence happened in black communities. Violence happened in in uh, uh, in, in uh, other communities that we didn't that didn't touch us that we weren't necessarily a part of, but uh, yeah, it's it, violence is very different now. But and, and in so many ways, and that's what in so many ways people and we're one of the things I'm real interested in is the difference in, in the in, in the experience that young people have today compared with the experience that, that young people had then. And it's, the Occupy movement is very interesting, and we've been involved a lot in talking about the Occupy movement and looking at the ways that that kind of Compares with and contrasts uh, with the with the uh, with the movement that we that we experience, and ours was much more. It, it, the the Occupy movement has gotten kind of into the participatory democracy to some extent that we that that we understood, but so much of what goes on now is so virtual and is so removed, yeah. and people are so in their own cocoons. And we everything we did was together, just communal. You know, now I I edited a, a, you know an online news magazine, and I. I'm sitting in my, I do it all by myself with my computer. And then when we put out an underground newspaper, I mean, a hundred people might come to the office in a given week. You know, on layout night, there were 15, 20 people around. People doing, you know, drawing, drawings and doing layout and, and stuff. And it was just everything. We lived in collective houses a lot. Uh, it was much more, it was much more communal. So there's a lot of things that were different about the, the time. But I think what you raise about violence is very interesting. Very uh, the one thing, I'd, I'd go back to the, the dichotomy I made to begin with, that we were inclined not to be violent because we had the tradition of the civil rights movement. Right. Um, 
But the other side was pretty was very fucking good. violent. Mm -hmm. The Oakland police um, with them and the, uh, Oakland, California is where the Black Panther Party started. It started as a response to police violence against black people. And the, the police, the white police in Oakland were recruited from the, uh, the deepest redneck bastions of, of the South and given you know, jobs uh, to police the black community in Oakland. And that was not a good It was interesting by the early 70s when I was in 67, 67, I was in Houston and we were publishing a newspaper called Space City. And in Houston, then the, the Ku Klux Klan was very active, had kind of reemerged and was active. And our, we faced violence every day. I mean, they shot up our offices, they bombed our cars, they bombed, uh, they, they shot up the, the, the stores of our advertisers. Uh, and on the, the radio station, the radio station specific the radio station I used to work was, was bombed off the air twice. They bombed the transmitter. Uh, and so, and, and they worked very much in concert with the Houston police. Uh, uh, the, it, later, this was actually you know, the best of you know, It was acknowledged openly that the, the Klan was, was, had infiltrated the Houston police. What they were, the, or the Houston, Houston, Houston cops, yeah, the Houston mm -hmm. cops and the Klan were, were recruited from the same East Texas town. Uh, yeah, you know, that were, the greatest of the same people. So, uh, but that was, it was interesting because there, there was a lot more actual kind of Violence. I mean, we actually, people actually sat up at night in the office with the shotguns. Yeah. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't clear right at the end of the movie, it was talking about people turning themselves in, but did everybody agree to turn themselves in, or did some people just figure that? the other side had nothing to offer them and they just kind of... But there's some people that are just still out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really know the answer to that question, um, frankly. I, one of the things that happened, uh, I mean, there were some people that went on into the next iteration, which was the Black Liberation Army. That's what David Gilbert did. That's what Judy Clark did. Uh, that's what Kathy Boudin did. Um, and... Uh, Kathy Boudin recently got out of jail. That's what um, Marilyn Buck, who was from Boston, who was a very yeah. a, a dear friend of ours and who was involved with the RAG in early, or very early days, just got out of prison uh, after being in there how many years? Uh, 30 or so. so you know, and they finally let her out because she was dying of cancer, which she did, which she died in days after she was released. But, but oh. The other part of, the, of what I'm, uh, of your question is, um, none of the cases of the people that turned themselves in were, they were held up because of the FBI's illegal uh, tactics. That was the, uh, the interesting irony to all of this. None of the cases stuck and the charges were dropped because uh, of, of illegal wiretaps and, and black uh, bag jobs and and, stuff and, and like this that. That really the movie didn't deal with. They talked about COINTELPRO and that really wasn't their story. But COINTELPRO was much more than it was. I mean, that people the FBI assassinated people. Yeah. Uh, there were, I mean, it, it, the, after the Freedom of Information Act and other uh, information was released, all there's all kind of information about about it out there, and that's one of the things that really destroyed. The, the, the movement and uh, they, they did it against the underground press. They especially did it against the black uh, against the black movement. I mean, it was it, it was a and virtually every uh, every institution every in, in the country had its own uh, espionage arm, and they all worked together. And, and I mean, the Internal Revenue Service, and the CIA, everybody. Uh, there were there were all these. It was just this. This, this web out there, and, and a lot of illegal activity was, was uh, like took place in there. I'd, I'd like to share my own espionage story. Um, I was living in a uh, six-floor walk-up in a tenement on um, uh, West uh, 17th Street in New York, uh, an apartment that had been handed to me by um, a weather collective uh, who apparently, I mean, they changed houses. Uh, they, they moved from 
apartment to apartment very often. Uh, that was part of their uh, way of avoiding um, uh, detection. And this one apparently had been compromised because when I was living there, um, I uh, ran into my next door neighbor in the hallway and he was carrying his suitcases. I said, okay, you know, what, you know what the, you moving out? And he said, no, I'm, I'm uh, going upstate to do summer stock, and it was the middle of the winter, winter, winter so that didn't make a lot of sense. Was he wearing a trench coat? Uh, no, no, he was, he was okay. Oh, but uh, a few days later, uh, when I said, um, well, you know, is, is uh, somebody watching your apartment? He said, no, nobody's going to be there. He seemed kind of nervous. Um, I said, well, I'll keep an eye on it. And a couple days later, I heard somebody coming out the door, so I looked through the peephole, and... There was a guy who did not belong in a six-floor tenement, wearing London fog, <laughs> the whole thing. And then I started seeing some other guys come in and out, and I ran into them in the hallway. And I was going, okay, this uh, doesn't seem right. So one night, I hear, I mean, the, the, the walls are really thin here. Um, I hear the door open and close, and I hear several footsteps going down. and. I listen at the, the, our common wall, and I don't hear anything, so I sneak out on the fire escape, go and peek in the window of his apartment, and see the, uh, the VU meters from the real, real tape recorder that's set up. So I had been, they had moved my neighbor out, moved themselves in so that they could eavesdrop on me. I went to a, I went to a <laughs> meeting in Bratislava, Czechoslovakia of, of representatives of the peace movement and kind of left religious types and, and movement journalists. We met with the, the, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese uh, in, in a meeting that actually resulted in the release of some prisoner, prisoners of war to the peace movement. Um, this was a big deal. It was organized by Tom Hayden, who was one of the founders of SDS, and Dave Dellinger, who was the major leader of the, of the, of the uh, pacifist movement. Uh, and um, I had, was in New York before I left, it, and I had this briefcase that had all this stuff in it about the meeting, and all the, you know, all the people who were going, and all the, the correspondence, and all of the materials that had been printed out, and whatever it was. Like. And I was at a phone booth, making a phone call, and I suddenly realized my briefcase wasn't there. And I didn't know what it happened to it, and I thought, well, maybe I left it somewhere else, I don't know. So I went back, and it turned out that a few days later, we got a call from the FBI, and they returned the briefcase. And they got lots and lots of good information out of that. But it was always a, it was always a reality. It was always around the corner. It was always, you know, always over our shoulder. And I, one of the things, and this quickly, is that I, I wrote an article for the Texas Observer uh, a few years ago about uh, uh, about um, surveillance of uh, students at UT and the, and the movement at UT and, the, and sort of bohemian community at UT uh, by the, by the uh, UT police. Uh, the guy who had been the police chief at the University of Texas died and his son, this is fairly recently, his son went into his office and found all these boxes of stuff. And so he went to he took the boxes to half price books to sell them <laughs> rather than you know, so he took half price books bought them uh, the one on North Lamar and then they started going through it and looking at what they had and a lot of it was about Charles Whitman it was all kinds of stuff about the the, the sniper the the tower the sniper the tower piece. but there were boxes of, of stuff about uh, the movement about SDS about the underground about uh, the sort of Austin has always had this kind of crazy bohemian community and all these people who so were just documents and documents. So Half Price Books got in touch with us and said, Half Price Books, gave, they gave all this stuff about Charles Whitman to the, to the UT Library, or to the Center for American History, but they contacted Alice Embry and me, who were leaders of the, of the, of the left, and, and said, hey, we want you guys to look at this stuff before give it to you because we're afraid it'll just get buried. It'll just get put, you know, in the, like the Raiders of the Lost Ark at the end, you know, where they take the rock, you know, they go back into the back. <laughs> so we went we went to the, by the, at this point they had the they had all this all these materials in, in Dallas at the corporate headquarters of Half Price Books. And so we went up there, went through everything, scanned everything, photocopied it, but and I wrote an article, it was a front page article 
cover article in the, in the Texas Observer about, I mean, there were thousands and thousands of pages. There were documents. There were, turned out that the, the editor of the UT student newspaper, of the Daily Texan, uh, was, a, was an informer for the, for the police. And it talked about how, the, it showed how the, the UT police worked with, the, with all of the other, and they, I mean, they had stuff on Janis, Janis Joplin, and things that <laughs> suspected of, of uh, bringing amphetamines into the camp. All this. Kinky Friedman. How far back is those archives up? Well, this was in the, uh, the early 60s. It didn't go back, back all the way to that rainy stuff? stuff? No. no. What was the name of that article in the Observer that I wanted to try to read? Uh, the Spies of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and it's online. It's online, and we had, there were photos. We had, we had there's also a lot of documents. There were probably, there were petitions from anti-war meetings with about hundreds and hundreds of names and stuff. Uh, Roger Baker's name is for me. This gentleman's been waiting to ask Sorry. a question for we're, a while. We're, we're, no uh, worries. Well, um, unless you ask a question, then we'll uh, wrap it up. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, um, you mentioned a little bit about the Occupy movement. Now, I was wondering what your opinions and thoughts were on that and the global revolution that's happening worldwide at the moment and what you maybe uh, foresee. Maybe. It's, yeah, I, I, it's phenomenal. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen next with the Occupy movement because if there's been so much fear about having any kind of real organization or leadership or whatever, which has been its strength, but also with the problem of how it, you know, it has to move beyond just, uh, you know, camping out uh, at parks and, and, you know, it's got to move on to something else. And I don't know whether, and there's a fear of moving into electoral politics, uh, but there's, it, you know, it's, it, at its core, it's kind of anarchistic. Uh, but I think it's, it's rich. Uh, it's it's wonderful. It came out of nowhere, and it changed the conversation in this country like that. Uh, there, it, cha the, it changed the dialogue. It took that it took the steam away from the Tea Party and made the conversation about the, the income gap in in the country and about and and the, there's it's just a real short step from there to having a, a serious class analysis of of what's happening in the country. Uh, that's that, you know, I